Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. The last two episodes have been about reading images and constructing textures that can be uploaded to the GPU. Unfortunately, we haven't yet had the chance to test all the code that we have been writing so far. Therefore, we need to be able to save the imported textures first and load them in a texture editor so that we can view them and visually check if they are imported correctly. This is the topic of this new episode as well as the next one, so sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Let me set a correct default value for alpha threshold and also make max MIP levels a static read-only property. I'm going to import PNG images for testing, so I need to fix this typo here before we can proceed. Now everything is in place for us to at least test if a texture can be imported without causing any disasters that humanity won't ever recover from. All we need to do now is to add the path of the texture file to the sources in import settings and rebuild the application. Instead of using real textures, I'm going to use a set of AI generated images. I'm using these instead of real texture images because they are more interesting to look at and also it's easier to spot any artifacts that might happen as a result of our importing code. As you can see, they're quite cinematic as well. They are also copyright free, so I won't get into trouble using them in my videos. You can get these if you like, in the same way I did, by making screenshots of the videos on this YouTube channel that showcases their AI generated images. Now let's try and drop one of these onto the content browser. As you know, we wrote a lot of code and we are going to test it all right now. And this is quite nerve wracking, as you can clearly hear it in my voice. Ah, I forgot to set a breakpoint, but you see it's trying to save the asset, which means that the import happened without errors. I can try again with a breakpoint to just make sure that's indeed the case. Here we see that we have 12 MIP levels, which sounds about right for a 4K image. Obviously, we also need to check visually if the texture was imported correctly. However, we don't have a texture viewer yet, and besides, we have to save the asset file first before being able to load and view the texture. So let's start with the save function. Oh, I forgot to make these read-only as well. So there you go. As usual, I set up the try-catch block first. Before we save the file, we check if a texture asset already exists with the same file name. This can happen when we are re-importing a texture and we want to save it to the same asset file. In this case, we are going to use the same GUID so that every material that references this texture will be able to use the updated version. As we all know, textures are the largest asset type in a game. A typical 1K texture is already 1 to 4 megabytes, depending on its format and encoding. So in order to save space on our hard drive, I'm going to compress the imported texture. This is not to be confused with block compression. It's rather like compressing a file using a lossless data compression technique. If you've ever used a zip file, then this is pretty much like that. So in a minute, I'm going to write a function that uses a built-in .NET API for data compression. But first I'll finish writing the rest of this function. So after compression, we calculate a hash value from the array bytes. This will be used to quickly compare if two asset files have the same content and make it easier to let the user know that they have duplicate assets, which they might want to get rid of. 
Next, we can write the data, starting with the asset header, which contains generic information like asset type, import date, the icon, etc. Next is the import settings, followed by texture information. Finally, we write the compressed image data. At the end, we set the full path and return the path to the saved asset file in a list. An empty list is returned if there was an exception. Now we need to write the compression function. In order to compress the image data in the slices array, we need to write them into a binary buffer. Previously, we wrote a function that reads the imported images from a binary buffer and creates a 3D array of slices, as we can see here. So we need to do this in reverse in our new function. Writing the slices into a binary buffer is rather simple. We loop through the array using a triple loop and write each slice to a buffer using a binary writer. At the end, we copy the buffer to a byte array and return it. Next, I'm going to create a new helper class for compressing and decompressing byte arrays. I'm going to put this here next to other helper classes. As I already mentioned, we can use a built-in class for this, which is called the deflate stream. We can use it to write our data to a memory stream and compress it while doing so. Again, we copy the compressed data to a byte array and return it. While we are here, let me also write a decompress function, which is very similar, so I'll just copy-paste the code that we have here. This time we use deflate stream to read in the compressed data and decompress it while writing to another buffer. Then we copy the buffer to a byte array and return it. We are now ready to save the texture asset, but now that I'm here, I'd like to split this for loop so that it doesn't calculate vector components when we are not showing a normal map. So basically, we write to a buffer, and only if the image is a normal map, we calculate the Z component from the red and green channels. Let me also write the decompress function in the texture class, because why not, it's only two lines of code.
And now we can try and save our imported texture. And we see here a new asset file that looks like the image which we dropped onto the editor. However, we can't open it because we don't have an asset editor for textures yet. So that's what we need to create next, and that's what we'll be doing for the rest of this episode, and also the next one, which means that the next five and a half videos will be all about creating a texture editor. Of course, we also need to be able to load the texture before we can look at it in the texture editor. Therefore, I'm going to write the load function. Check if the file exists and it's an asset file. Then try to read it in a try catch block. We use a binary reader and a file stream which will open the file for reading. Next, we read the data in the file in the same order as we saved them. This time, we need to decompress the images. Finally, we check if it has valid dimensions and return true. Now we are ready to add the texture editor. Let's create a new folder in the editors folder. Here, we'll add the view model for the texture editor. Since this is an editor, it also has to implement the iAsset Editor interface. We can see the same thing happening for the Geometry Editor class here. Before implementing this in the Texture Editor, I'll add two extra properties to this interface. The first one is the state of the editor. Since loading, importing, and saving assets can take some time, it'd be nice to have some indication of what the editor is doing. Here I just add some generic states that I can think of. The second property is the asset GUID, which we set before loading the asset. This is to prevent a crash when the user tries to open an asset file again while it's being loaded. So now we have to add these for the geometry editor as well. Here we are not using the state for geometry editor yet, but we have to set the asset GUID before loading the asset. As we can see here, when we try to open an editor for an asset file, we check if an asset with this GUID is already opened. But if the asset is still being loaded, then the asset property will be null and it will crash the application. We get rid of this problem by using the asset GUID property. Now that I'm here, I'd like to refactor this part of this method in order to be able to call it separately. Now 
So what this does is it just opens a new window for an editor of type T. Okay, now I can copy and paste this from the geometry editor and use it for texture editor. We only have to rename geometry to texture. In set asset, we can set the state to done regardless of whether loading the texture was successful or not. Then we set the asset GUID, create a new instance of the texture class and set the state to loading. Because loading a texture can take some time, it's executed asynchronously on a separate thread. This keeps the UI thread responsive while the texture is loading. We assign the texture property next. Before we go any further, we can try and see if we can open a new window containing the texture editor. So first I'll add a new user control that's in charge of displaying the texture. Don't forget to remove texture editor from the namespace. I'm setting the design time data context for this control so it has autocomplete available for properties. I'll also make this control focusable because later we are going to use keyboard keys to zoom in and out of the image. For now let's just set a pink background. Next I'll add the texture editor view which is the entire user interface for the texture editor. After correcting the namespace, we can set its view model by creating an instance of the texture editor class. Again, for now we just add the texture view just to have something to show up when we open a window. Opening the editor window is rather simple and is done in the same way as we did for the geometry editor view. Now when we double click our textures, a new window will open with a beautiful pink background. In the next videos, we are going to use the loaded texture and display that instead of the pink background. I hope there was something new for you in this video. As always, thank you for joining me today and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. 
please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!